Good evening, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to this prayer at the close of the day. It is Sunday. It is the 29th day of October, year of our Lord, 2023. I do pray this finds you well. A chilly day out there, particularly what we were used to a, a week ago. But it's fall and uh, winter, uh, uh, she is a coming. Today, many of our churches have celebrated Reformation, uh, the Festival of the Reformation. The actual day is October 31st, All Hallows' Eve. We'll talk about it more on, on that day. But uh, today was a very nice day in church as we celebrated a uniquely uh, Lutheran festival day about uh, the Reformation, all that meant theologically and for the life of, of the church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Tonight we read from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 19th chapter, verses 16 through 30, so the rest of chapter 19. And behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything to follow you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly, I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. That is a, a very well-known text, very well-known episode in our Lord's teaching. And it begins with this man. And... I think I've mentioned this before when we've come up to this text that the ancient church historian Eusebius tells us that this man, he's a young man, that comes to Jesus is Mark, the author, of, of course, reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, Levi, the tax collector, but Mark as well. Uh, we have the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. So it is interesting, just with that little tidbit, that we have this question that's posed. Teacher. Uh, we don't have Lord. We don't have Rabbi. Just teacher. What deed, what good deed must they do to have eternal life? Right there he's tipping us off. And of course our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is God. Knows the man's heart before he even asks the question. But it's another one of those wonderful teaching moments that we all need to hear so, so badly. So he says okay you know, after the man asks, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus says to him, 
well, what do you ask me about what is good? Remember the question was good deed. There is only one who is good. Of course, that's God. Now, already there, he's trying to shift the man's way of thinking. Uh, this is part of repentance, is seeing things in the proper way, having our eyes opened, our ears unplugged, to hear the truth about ourselves and the world around us, hear the truth about God and ourselves, to see who we are as we stand before him. So this is what Jesus is doing here. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He says, okay, why, what do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. And, and the point of that is, you know, who do you think standing in front of you? So you need to listen to what I say. Why are you even talking to me if you don't understand or believe what I'm doing? Now, that's kind of an interesting little thought right there. That we have uh, in our culture around us, and I find this fascinating, that we have people who could give a rip about what I'm reading to you this, this evening and, and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but realize that there's an advantage to confessing his name or, or using, let's say not confessing, but using his name uh, and trying to, to speak in Christian platitudes. And uh, um, it's just sort of laughable when they do because they can't. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't know what they're doing. Um, you know, the whole idea is they're gonna they're gonna use this name of our Lord to to get you to do something without really understanding who Jesus is and amending their lives and repenting the way our Lord seeing him as Savior and their need for a Savior. They just see him as something we can use. Isn't that funny that somebody who really would mock this and believe this will still use it to uh to try to get you, a believer, to do something. So it's quite interesting what our Lord is doing here. You know, he says, and remember how he, often he does this, he asks questions. There's only one who's good. Okay. You want to enter eternal life? Keep the commandments. I get I'm frustrated, again, going back to what I hear in the greater world around us about when people use arguments from the faith that have no idea what they're what they're talking about and one of the the things that our culture seems to be blinded to is one the of course the existence of the devil and evil in the world and that uh, we can legislate evil to an end it's not possible because uh, you'd have to legislate people to an end please don't do that but that, I'm afraid, is sometimes, sometimes I think about this is where this is all going. Because, again, if you, if you fundamentally can't change people's hearts and you can't, only God can do that, well, how do you get them to do what you want? If you beat them in submission, if that doesn't work, well, you know. That's, that's you know, certainly something that, that we've seen over and over again in history. But our culture, and often the people that we elect to lead us or are appointed to lead us uh, by their countries, don't seem to understand this concept of the fallenness of man. And they'll, they'll use scripture in such a way, without that understanding, to, to just sort of force you into doing something uh, that they think should be done. Um, quite fascinating. So notice what Jesus does. He takes those kinds of thoughts here and you know, about we can find our way home, if you will, and says, okay, you want to enter life after this question is, what, what are the good things I need to be doing? Remember that question also is devoid of Christ. And this man comes to him and says, well, teacher, you know, what do I have to do? He doesn't acknowledge who Jesus is and what we can't do. So Jesus is saying, all right, you think you can earn your way to heaven? Well, you know, the standard for the commandments is do this and you will live. And if you break the law, the commandments, at one point you're guilty of breaking it all and you're done for. But this is a statement of who God is. It's a statement of him being perfectly holy and that perfect holiness not being able to tolerate sin in his presence. And, of course, his anger with what we are and what we do and our thumbing, is, our thumbing our nose at the good gifts he gives to us. So anyway, Jesus says, okay, you know, Keep the commandments. No, he's doing that. Should we keep the commandments? Of course. What he's trying to do is wake this man up. 
So notice now what this man says, the one that's trying to question our Lord. Well, which ones? Well, some are easier than others, right? At least we like to think that. And Jesus said, now notice what Jesus starts with here. We should not murder. We should not commit adultery. So that's what? Commandment uh, 6, well, commandment uh, 5, commandment 6, um, uh, you should not steal 7, 8, bear false witness, honor your father and mother, that's uh, 4, and love your neighbors yourself, that's a summation of, of them all. So we would call that the second table of the law, tablet of the law, the first tablet, two stone tablets, carved by the finger of God. The first tablet, the first three commandments, deal with our vertical relationship, our relationship to God. I have no other gods, so don't misuse his name, honor his day, Sabbath day. And then the second tablet has the subsequent seven commandments that have to do with our relationship to each other. So that's where he starts. That's often where we can think we can do good, you know. Um, we're doing okay. We, uh, which ones, you know? Well, um, you know, here, here, have you loved your neighbor? Now, most of us could say, if we just sort of take a superficial reading of these commandments, and then you start thinking of the Sermon of the Mount here. Like, okay, I haven't committed adultery. I haven't murdered anyone. I haven't stolen anything um, since I was very young. Uh, try to tell the truth in all circumstances and honor my parents, of course. Um, and then loving my neighbor as myself. Okay, now remember Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, how he says, okay, you need to understand the depth of those commandments. The, uh, the one about adultery, look at another woman with lust. The one about murder, you call a person a fool, you harbor hatred in your heart. Well, all of a sudden, things are looking rather dicey. You know, the way we dishonor our parents and the way we covet and how we steal by trying to make it look good from those around us, uh, whether it's cheating on your taxes, yeah, that's stealing, whether it's going to work um, and, and uh, hiding while you're getting paid so you don't have to, uh, uh, you still collect the paycheck, but uh, you don't have to do a full day's work, uh, that also is stealing. Uh, you know, insurance fraud, sort of the white collar crimes as we call them. Oh, everybody does it. No, it doesn't matter whether everybody does it or not. So most of us, though, you know, I hang around with nice people would say, at least at a glance, I haven't done those things. Now, we as Christians, you know, when, when the Lord opens our eyes to who we really are, it's like, yeah, I'm guilty. I'm guilty of all of that. Especially go back to the Sermon on the Mount, the way he unpacks it, I've harbored hatred, etc. So, the young man says, I've kept all these. You can almost imagine our Lord chuckling. What do, you, what do I still lack? Jesus says, okay. Now that was the second part of the law. Here, you want to be perfect. Now it gives him the first part. You shall have no other gods. Remember, this man is rich. Sell what you have. Give to the poor. And don't worry about it, because you'll have treasures in heaven. Now come follow me. Which means it's going to be very rough for you. you know, he's, this man is probably aware. If it's Mark, he's certainly aware of how Jesus is living, you know, no place to lay his head, kind of a itinerant preacher and kind of living, uh, God, it's amazing to think about God and creator living off the charity of others uh, by their gifts and, and what they do. It's kind of amazing to think about God working in that way. So Jesus says, you're going to follow me. You, know, you called me a good teacher at the beginning. Uh, well, I am not only a good teacher, I am God. And you're going to follow me. Now this man who you know, thinks that, you know, his wealth is made it pretty good for him and that uh, since he's comfortable, he can think, yeah, I haven't done this and I haven't done that and I'm doing all right. Jesus has just dropped the bomb and said, oh, you think so? Well, let's put that to the test. Show me how much you love me. Show me that there you have no other gods. Give all that away. Stuff that you are using to be able to answer that first question with not 100% truth. All these I have kept. So, the young man hears this, and he goes away, not angry, but sorrowful. That's interesting. Because God, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, through his word, is 
doing its work. His word is doing its work. And you have to remember that when we share the word with those around us, don't sugarcoat things. Don't water things down because you, know, you think, oh, people aren't going to like this. Our Lord certainly doesn't do that. You have to trust in the word. You have to trust that our Lord says that the word's going to go out and do what he purposes it to do according to his time, according to his will. Sometimes it might look like an abject failure. Sometimes, sometimes it's going to look like a great success. But you have the word, right? Just proclaim that word. They make it man. I mean, think about it again. You know, what's our little laboratory to, to where we can think about these things and see how they actually work out in our lives? Think about if you have children in your lives. You, you, you know, you can't lie to your child. You have to tell, tell your children the hard truths of life. And they might be, you know, and call them to account. And you know they're going to get angry with you. All right? But the reason you do it is for their own benefit and open their eyes and wake, you, and, and wake them up. And they may go off and hop, but years later they'll come to you and say, I see what you were doing there, and you were right. So this man goes away sorrowful. Now, if, if Eusebius is right, we're going to assume he is, that this is Mark. You know, Mark ends up traveling Mark, Mark, you know, with Paul and Barnabas. Travels with the apostles and ends up, ends up being martyred uh, um, in uh, Alexandria, I believe. And, uh, you know, gives us the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. And so, you know, you never know what God's going to do. You just have to trust his word. It's going to do what it's going to do. And people's first reaction must maybe one of anger. And maybe one of going off. You know, how we talked a little bit about this at Bible study this morning after church about how you know, sometimes the things we say about what Scripture, um, uh, or the things that we confess, the things that Scripture teaches, people, particularly from other confessions, get very angry with us. So, of course, you know, the screeching that goes on in the culture about transgenderism and stuff like that, we're, we're called hateful for proclaiming the truth. The time will come where people will see who actually love them and come back and with gratitude and will give all the glory to God and say, you know, you, know, you were right. No, God was right. God was right. Trust his word and don't worry about the response. It's not your problem. So the man goes away sorrowful and Jesus says to his disciples, Amen, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will the rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because that, that wealth can become an idol. So now I know people who are very wealthy and are very pious, very uh, um, faithful people. Uh, you know, but there are people who, their wealth, their money is their idol, and, and they can't see parting with it because it's responsible for what they think, all the good in their lives. So Jesus acknowledges that here, and teaches us that here when he says, you know, it's only with difficulty that a rich person is going to enter the kingdom of heaven because they have another God. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples here then are like, well, come on now. Well, then who can be saved? And Jesus, it's just a little detail. Jesus looks at them. A little cute little, or uh, uh, perfunctory, is not the word. What a sweet, beautiful detail that our Lord looks at them. Again, you wonder if he's got that wry smile on his face. Like, man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. He chips, you know, so think about that. When you're worried about, gee, do I have to water down the word or you get mad at a church like ours, and sometimes that does happen. I get some feedback once in a while, not very often, but, oh, pastor, and I certainly aware of my brothers who have similar um, recollections. You know, you, you can't preach that because it's going to put people off. You don't have to. It's the word, why do you talk about baptism so much? Well, I have to. Um, of the Lord's Supper, I have to. Uh, the things that we preach, you know, that, that we, sola scriptura, scripture alone, that's all we have is the word. You know, why, well, you know it, it, it drives people off. So it's sort of like, well, just give them the soft stuff and then give them, you know, do the old bait and switch. We're not allowed to do that. You know, we think it's us. And it's not possible with us to, to, uh, say these things and change people's hearts, but God promises to be working through his word and it's possible with him to chip away the stone walls in people's hearts to chip through his. Remember this man goes away sorrowful. He's got to think it through. 
then he's going to still have contact with that word of God. And he's going to be, you know, he's going to be saved. He's going to realize who Jesus is, with Mark again, and he's going to realize what Jesus has done for him, and he's going to end up sharing that news. That's going to cost him his life. Well, it's temporal life. He's celebrating eternal life. So anyway, there, the text goes on a little bit from there. But it's just fascinating to think about this. Don't be trying to put God to the test. Just trust in his word. It's all we have. It's all we need. I believe in God, the Father, almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is, now, and will be forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, having been blessed this day with the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ and his great gifts, may we be filled with joy as we go out through our to our various vocations throughout the work week. And may our faith, which has been nourished by the blessed gifts of our Lord Jesus Christ, bear fruit for you this week. Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with those who are crying out to you for healing. We ask you to be with Myron, Dennis, Dave, Don, Wayne, Pat, Luray, Klaus, Ardo, for Cecil, for Lorena, Aaron, Allison, Allie, Scott, Amy, Don, Fern, Ashley, Camden, Jason, Bob, Jim, Clint, Beth, Chris, Eric, Tom, Paul, Brad, Christy, Jeff, Dylan, Jeremy, Marlis, Anita, Dave, Karen, Sue, Tim, Ron, Bert, Heather, John, Chris, Lori, Don, Liberty, Joe, Phil, Katie, Michelle, and all who cry out to you. Heavenly Father, place your healing hand upon them according to your good and gracious will. All this we ask in the precious name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Visit our dwellings, O Lord, and in your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. For your hands I commend myself, my body, soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I'm going to sing uh, one stanza, I think, tonight of hymn 543, What Wondrous Love Is This. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this that Caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul, for my soul. To bear the dreadful curse for my soul. That stands a one of four of him, 543. What wondrous love is this? With that, my brothers and sisters, I bid you blessed rest. God's grace will see you tomorrow night. Good night.